Imagine that I asked you all to stand up, to follow me out of the room, down the stairs, through the campus, and up to Stirling Highway. As we're standing there on the highway, we're going to see lots of traffic rushing past. People going shopping, off for afternoon tea, maybe coming home from sports events. And of all those people that we're watching rushing about their day, one in five of them will experience mental illness this year. One in five. That's 20% of Australian adults this year, 20% last year, and 20% next year. Can you tell which ones just by looking at them? It's not always the same one in five, though. Sometimes it'll be someone who has an ongoing depressive disorder. They're going to be the one in five every year. And other times it'll be someone who has a short-lived post-traumatic stress disorder. Maybe they're affected for a couple of years and then they recover and don't have that happen again. Some of you are sizing up everyone else on your row, aren't you? You're going one, <laughs> two, three. Phew, it's not me, it's him. <laughs> Trust me, you can't do that. But it's interesting, because I have been scooping you out a bit today. I've been watching you. And what we know is that if it's one in five in a year and some people have a one-off experience and others have a recurrent experience, it's going to be more than one in five in your lifetime. It's actually going to be higher than 20% in our lifetime. It's actually 48%. Almost half of us will experience mental illness in our lifetime. And from watching you all today and analysing some of your interactions, some of your wardrobe choices, <laughs> been inspired by some of the shoes I've seen, I have. I have assessed that this 50%, this half of the room, is the half, you can't do that, can you? You can't tell just by looking at people, but you can rest assured, if it's 48% of us in our lifetime, if it's not you, it's your partner, or your child, your best friend, your mum, it's someone close to you. So it's not enough for you to not care about it. It's not something that just happens down the road at Perth Clinic or over at Greylands. It's something that happens in all of our lives. Mental health is part of health, and unfortunately, mental illness plays a part in that. But we can do a lot better at the way we recognise and respond to mental illness. Have a look at this list. These are the most common mental illnesses we see in Australia today. And I want you to play with me for a little bit. I want you to put your hand up if you think, let's say substance use disorder is the most common of those. Hand up high. Hmm. A couple of you who might want to think about why you think that. Maybe it's <laughs> not actually the answer and maybe it's more a reflection of who you were hanging out with last night um, than what we actually see as the community prevalence rate. So substance use disorder, absolutely debilitating devastating condition when it's experienced, but fortunately not the most common. Those of you who want to see me later, I'll be at the back. <laughs> what, about, what about depressive disorders? Hand up if you think this is the most common. Loud and proud, hands up, come on. All right, beautiful. So that's probably most of you from what I can see under the house lights. Probably most of you. And you wouldn't be alone. I mean, you're wrong, but you wouldn't be alone in... <laughs> Sorry. You wouldn't be alone in thinking that, even though you are wrong. So we know that we talk a lot about depression in this country. It's kind of had a big sexy PR campaign around it. We've had some beautiful, beautiful public education campaigns to teach us about recognising depression and responding to it so we can reduce some of the risks. It's been fabulous. But in a way, we've kind of become so au fait with it that we use the terminology a little bit loosely now. I had someone last week who will remain nameless, but they're in the audience, lamenting, <laughs> they know who they are, lamenting about how depressed they were that we were so annihilated by the South Africans in the cricket. <laughs> now that's not clinical depression, that may be frustration and disappointment and a little bit of delusion if they thought there was going to be a different result, but it's not actually, <laughs> it's not actually clinical depression. 
So sometimes we use this word so loosely and we're quite willing to diagnose ourselves and everyone else we know that we don't necessarily give the real weight to clinical depression when it's actually experienced. It's a devastating illness. It's not just having a sad mood. It's not just being a little bit disappointed about things. It's not even being in a bit of a funk sometimes. That's just part of being human. If you've never been in a bit of a funk, then check that you've got a pulse because I'd be a bit worried. But what we know is that it's when people are in that state and it's ongoing and it's debilitating and it's distressing and they can't just pull themselves out of it. And yet it's still not the most common, even though it's the one that we talk about the most. Psychosis isn't the most common either. That's much, much less common, although really, really debilitating um, potentially when it occurs, which leaves us with anxiety disorders. The most common mental illness in Australia today is anxiety disorders. 14% of us will experience an anxiety disorder every year. For some people, that'll be a short-lived and others, it'll be a long-term, devastating, debilitating condition. But in our society, we don't talk about anxiety disorders, do we? We talk about stress, almost like a badge of honour. I'm so stressed, it's caused by my boss, by my partner, by my mother-in-law, not my mother-in-law, she's gorgeous, in case you see the YouTube video. <laughs> You know, it's caused by something else out there. We don't recognise that it's actually a mental health condition that can be really, really devastating and can impact on our functioning. And most importantly, we don't realise that there's help available. I can't help you with your mother-in-law, but we certainly can help people with anxiety disorders. There's a lot that can be done. And yet it's the most common and unfortunately really, really widely misunderstood. And I think one of the illnesses that still has an awful amount of shame and self-stigma around it. It seems like people are not willing to disclose their anxiety as much as maybe depression. In courses all the time, people will sit there telling me about their experience with depression and people they know with depression, but they come and talk to me privately in the break if it's about anxiety disorders, because it's not quite as au fait to talk about publicly. I was doing a mental health awareness session down in a small country town earlier in the year and this bloke walked in and much like many of the blokes in this organisation walked in with his steel cap boots, his reflector jacket and his hard hat. Not quite sure what training he thought we were doing but anyway he was geared up for whatever I threw at him <laughs> and he's, he sat in the back row with his arms crossed, his shades on and didn't say a word for the whole hour and a half. Now that's fine because I like the sound of my own voice so it didn't need to have him participating. But it was really interesting, I thought, a, a bit of a, a judgment on my part, I thought maybe he was one of the ones who were sent here. Because every organisation, they just the boss tells people, you need to go there, and then I have to tell them why they're there. So I thought he was maybe one of those. And he, at the end of the session, offers to carry my bag out to my car. And I thought, oh, so nice, yeah, sure, help me here. And so we walk out to the car, and we get there, and we stop, and he hasn't said a word to me still. But then he gets really, really kind of contorted in the face. And his voice with a wee little bit of a shake in it, he says, that was me. Everything you talked about in there was me. That anxiety stuff. I've been having those bloody panic attacks. I didn't know what it was. You've just told me what's been happening. It's been going on for 18 months. Every single time I go to the shop, I have a panic attack and I have to leave. And I just thought I was going bloody crazy. And I asked him, does anyone else know what's happening? Have you spoken to anyone about this? <sighs> no, I live alone. I stopped going to the footy club because I didn't want the, mate, the blokes to find out down there. And I haven't told my mates because they'll just think that I'm absolutely bonkers. And it was really, really interesting because his biggest fear was that these panic attacks had started occurring more frequently. And what if it happened at work and the blokes at work saw him? What would be the impact there? He was terrified of what they would think. And so instead of getting any support, he just continued to allow them to perpetuate and to increase in their frequency and their distress. And he's not alone. We did an international survey last year where we asked people to tell us about what it felt like and what the reactions they had when they disclosed their mental health issues in the workplace. 85% of the people who had disclosed mental illness at work said that their response was absolutely devastating. The response was that people increased the bullying which had been contributing to their distress in the first place. 
that people were unfairly dismissed but didn't have the emotional fortitude to get through a claim against that employer for that direct discrimination. That people were left out of social events or any future performance issues in the whole team were blamed on them and their bipolar disorder or depression or whatever it might have been. Really devastating. So it's no wonder my fella in his hard hat doesn't disclose what's going on in the workplace because experience sometimes tells us that it's not safe to do so. This couple here, Betty Kitchener and Tony Jorm, developed this amazing program to help teach us some skills to be able to deal with recognising and appropriately responding to mental health issues. And Betty and Tony developed this course so that we could learn if this man's having a heart attack those of you who put your hand up before with first, that you've done first aid, James has got your number and if this man has a heart attack, he's going to get you to come and give him CPR. But what we don't have is other people who might be able to help this man if he's feeling suicidal. We might be able to help this lady if she breaks her leg, but this lady, I'm sorry if you have a panic attack, we might do the 1950s style of slap you across the face or give you a paper bag. Neither a good idea, just as a take home message. <laughs> and so Betty and Tony developed this amazing course where we can actually teach people how to look after and recognise and respond to mental health issues in themselves and others. And it's brilliant. And I started delivering this course and just was in love with it. And then I realised, hang on a minute, I'm going into prisons and teaching prison officers how to look after the mental health needs of their inmates. I'm working with disability service providers and teaching them how to look after the mental health needs of their clients. But who the heck's looking after these service providers? No one was. So we were only focusing on mental illness and that's what we tend to do in this country. We focus on the ill health part of it. We don't focus on the good, positive capabilities that we might have. We certainly don't foster mental health and wellbeing a lot. So as well as making you think about mental illness being maybe something that's relevant to you, I also want you to think about the things you can do to stay mentally well to prevent yourself from getting into that one in five. And that if you do get in there, that maybe you can get a little bit help, maybe a bit sooner. So I'm gonna leave you with a couple of ideas. The first thing is, I want you to check yourself out. Now some of you, like my children, have no problem checking yourself out. <laughs> Others of you may be a little bit less willing. And I'm not gonna bring mirrors out, it's okay. But I want you to just imagine with me that I've got a string from this side of the stage over to this side. And on this side here, we've got someone who's really distressed, they're emotionally unwell, they're struggling, they're finding that their coping skills are just not working anymore and their functioning is really affected. Through to over this side where we've got someone who's absolutely flourishing, they're buoyant, they're levitating off their chair, they feel that awesome with life. Now close your eyes for me. Don't tickle the people next to you, keep your hands to yourself, but keep your eyes closed. I want you to visualise for yourself where you sit on that continuum. Are you on the left hand side? Maybe masking beautifully so no one else around you knows, but maybe struggling? Or are you on the right hand side where you are just buoyant and blooming and you're feeling fabulous? Open your eyes and have a look around. Does anyone around you know where you were sitting? Do you know where they were sitting? Sometimes we mask really well. Sometimes those closest to us might know. And then other times we may not even ourselves know what's going on because we're so good at just masking and getting through and not really stopping and having a look. What I want to encourage you though is that if you were sitting on this side or somewhere on the continuum where you're not quite happy with, get some resources. Don't just be like the hard hat fella and sit there and worry and let it ruminate and get worse. Actually get some help for yourself. If you were to have something wrong with your heart, you'd go and see a cardiologist, wouldn't you? If you'd have something wrong with your eye, you'd go and see an ophthalmologist or something that does something with eyes. I hope that wasn't a bug person. You'd go and see an eye person, wouldn't you? They might help you as well, you never know. But you'd go and see a specialist, an expert in the area. And yet with mental health, we tend to just think, no, I don't know, it's a bit awkward, I won't talk to anyone, I'm not sure, they might just give me medication and lock me up. We have this stigma that we put on ourselves, let alone anyone else putting it on us. You don't have to wear it on your sleeve and let everyone know. It's not, well, this is how I'm feeling today. It's not colour-coded. It doesn't have to be everyone else's business, but surely it can be yours, and you might need to just get the resources to help you with that. The next thing is to get some balance. 
So we hear a lot about this elusive old idea of 888, so eight hours of work, eight hours of play, eight hours of sleep a day. And balance is one of the big issues that people keep telling me is causing their anxiety and their distress. I have a bit of a slight, I guess, change on that formula. Ours is to bloom, you want to focus your time and your positive attention in the areas of your life that are underscored by your values. I don't know if you've heard Freya Madeline Stark, she's got some amazing work. She says, there can be no success or happiness if the things we believe in are different from the things we do. And I think that that might be a really interesting nugget for us to sit and think on in terms of the idea of balance and, and getting some emotional well-being back in our lives. The next idea is to find four. So to actually find four positive nurturing things for yourself every week as a way of enhancing your positive mental health and well-being. Some of you are going, four in a week? Four, I haven't done four all year. <laughs> Some of you might go, four in a week? I've done four in a day. That's all right. It's just about finding four. The next thing is to wake up. To not just wait for those two days a year that we stop and think about how we're going. You know those two days. One of them's coming up. New Year's. Someone said Christmas. It's not Christmas. We're just consuming on Christmas. There are presents. Oh, at least at my house. It's New Year's, New Year's Eve or day, depending on how much of a big one you're going to tie on, right? But around New Year's is when we stop and go, the year that was, how am I going, how am I travelling? And then the other day is your birthday. Instead, I'd encourage you to actually stop, check yourself out ongoing, wake up to your mental health and wellbeing. You're the only one that can do something about it. So I'd like to leave you with two ideas. Firstly, show compassion for others who are experiencing emotional and mental distress. You never know when it might be you or someone that you love. And secondly, and really importantly, start with compassion for yourself. Look after your mental health and well-being proactively. Don't just passively accept, expect it to happen to you. Take charge. Bloom. Thank you.